Amen. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> Hello, everybody, by Facebook, watching by Facebook. We're glad you're joining us this evening. I am so glad to be back. Amen. 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 So, my mother and I, my mother in law and I left to Colorado Springs last Thursday. So um, I had missed Wednesday service and then Sunday and then Tuesday's our redemption. So I feel like I've been gone like for three months. But it was nice to be back home with everybody. I, and I feel like you've been gone for three months too, baby. <laughs> back with my papa bear. <laughs> he was crying for you. He said it was time to eat sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, yeah. Uh, no. I, I left him food, okay? If he chose sandwiches, <laughs> we're afraid to turn on the stove. <laughs> he started our apartment on fire one day, but that's another sermon. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you for this message. Heavenly Father, and I just thank you, Lord, that you have given me the honor and the privilege of bringing forth your word, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will guide my lips that this message will come forth with simplicity and clarity that all may understand heavenly father and i'm careful to give you all the honor praise and glory in jesus name amen amen, amen. <clears throat> please excuse me if my voice goes in and out a little bit there was like four feet of snow in certain parts of, of colorado it was just amazing when we we're going through the mountains you know we went my mother-in-law and i went to um, a women's conference in Colorado Springs and, and it was in Spanish, you know, and, and uh, when I invited her to go, I meant to tell her, you know, it's in Spanish, that way you'll understand everything, but it came out the wrong way and I said, hopefully you'll learn something. <laughs> <laughs> so she, ha she had to stop teasing me about that, so, but we had a good time, it was an awesome time, just me and her, you know, we just snuck away and I really felt that that we both needed it, you know, and, and I just wanted, I guess, just that, that mama-daughter time together, and it was an awesome Amen. time. We got to fellowship all the way over there and um, ate some flower seeds, like little parrots all the way over there, but, you know, as we got over there, we were in the conference, and it was just amazing. I met some amazing women. There was some amazing um, messages, and it takes a lot of work to put something like that together, so... So I really appreciate that, that these women take time away from their own families to prepare something like this for us to go and be refreshed, you know. And, um, and I'm still kind of like in a daze, you know. It kind of feels like you go away and, and, and you have spiritual surgery, if you will, you know. I left everything at the altar, but I also had the honor and privilege of praying for women out there and, and, and just being a comfort to some women and my mother-in-law and I. We were able to just sit in bed at night and laugh and take selfies and, and, and just, you know, it was a good time. It was a good time. But, you know, as we were leaving, uh, because our friend Sylvia lives in uh, Silt, Colorado, so we, she went back with us, but as we were, we left the conference and we we're going back to her home. She's watching. Uh, hi, Sylvia. Si estás viendo. Besos. Um, so as we were going back to her home, we left the conference probably about 12.31 and uh, heading back to her home. And, and we had been hearing in the weather that there was going to be a storm passing through Colorado. Well, we didn't think that it was going to be a storm, storm. You know, we thought it's already going to be May. It's probably going to be a little bit of rain. No, as we got further, we got further up the mountain. Um, it started snowing and we didn't think it was going to stick on the road because they hadn't had snow in a while. You know, they had, there's a lot of traffic. So we were going for a little bit and then all of a sudden these big old like pancake sized snowflakes start hitting the windshield. Oh my God. And my mother in law was just like, ay, 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 ay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm trying to listen to the GPS and ay, ay, ay. <laughs> No, Mika, go back, go back. <laughs> No, 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 go back. And, and 
and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, and I am like white knuckled on the steering wheel, trying to show her, you know, that there's, I'm just trying to be calm for her. We have Sylvia in the back, and I'm sure she's like holding on to the suitcases, and, and I mean, as the snowflakes started getting bigger and bigger, it started sticking on the road. And I only have a four-cylinder little car. And so I'm just trying to purpose to not step on the gas so I don't have to step on the brakes. You know how that goes. And, and so as we're, we're going up, that and going up is, was not that bad. But when you're going down and you realize you can't really use the brakes, it was I got a little bit nerve-wracking there. So as I was holding on to the steering wheel, I was just praying and I was saying, okay, Jesus, you have to come. My mother-in-law, yes, Jesus, because I'm like, okay, Jesus, you take the steering wheel, Jesus, you drive. Yes, Jesus, okay, Jesus, see, Jesus. <laughs> And I'm holding it on to Shrew and she's like, <laughs> I'm telling her to go to sleep, you know, so like, go to sleep. <laughs> and this is my mother-in-law on the windshield, yes, Jesus, <laughs> yes, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if she hadn't repented by that point, she repented that day, okay, <laughs> Oh my gosh, and there's semi trucks passing us at 50 miles an hour, and it's like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, that car could just, that truck can just go over my car, and as I'm holding on to a steering wheel, and I'm saying, okay, Lord, you got this, because there's no turning back. Because where would we go? We had Sylvia that needed to get home, and, and you know, and, and there's just no turning back. And the Lord said, you know, you take this as an example of the storms you go through in life. Take it as an example. Look, look what's going on. Look at the sky, look at the snowflakes, how big they are. I mean, I had my windshield wipers as fast as they could go and I could not keep up with the snow. I would just see these big old chunks of snow coming off my windshield wipers. And um, so I finally made an agreement. My mother-in-law told her, I'll drive you, pray, okay? Just pray and silently pray. <laughs> So, so we're just going there, and, and the Lord said, you know, that's how, this is exactly how some storms in life can get. They get pretty bad to where you can't even see where you're going. Yeah. The snow was coming so fast. I could barely see the lights of the car in front of me. And, uh, and the Lord is saying, you know, sometimes this is the way that, that your personal storms in life get. But there is no going back. There's no going back. No matter how the bad the storm is, we had to keep moving forward so that we could get where we were going because I knew that if we just kept driving sooner or later, the storm was going to get lesser and lesser and then we were going to get to where, where our friend lived and it wasn't going to be as bad as up in the mountains, you know. So my focus had to be on that yellow line on the road, holding on to that steering wheel, making sure I didn't look to the left or to the right because to the right was a mountain and to the left was a cliff. So I'm like, just, you know, look straight. And when you're going through a storm like that, it kind of reminds you what the scripture tells you is not to look to the left and not to look to the right. Don't deviate. You, you stay on that narrow path that Jesus has put you. And no matter how bad the storm gets, he'll lead you and he'll guide you and he'll take you there. So it was, it was a time, and I'll tell you, and we barely got to our friend's house before it got dark. That was just my biggest prayer, Lord, don't let it get dark. Because the sun's out now, and I can barely see the car in front of me, and if it gets dark, we're going to get in trouble. You know, we're up there in the mountains, the road's starting to stick, and, you know, I'm in my little four-cylinder car, you know, and I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, but the, Lord, the Lord's hand just guided us, and it was amazing, you know. My mother-in-law got tired of screaming. And I don't know when she comes down, the first thing she says, is there a Walmart? <laughs> She's ready to shop. No, I think we need to buy some underwear. <laughs> she was like, wow. As I was thinking about that today, I'm going to take you to some scriptures, you guys, and and I'm going to just use the trip that we went on to kind of explain to you guys what the Lord showed me while we were there. 
And we're going to go to Luke chapter 9, verses 57 and 62 through 62. And I'm reading from the New King James Version today. Luke 9, el 9 de Lucas, 57, 62. And, and this scripture is called the cost of discipleship. 62. Mm -hmm. Luke 9, verses 57 through 62. And it'll, it's titled the cost of discipleship because there is a cost of discipleship. You know, once you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, there is no going back. There is no going back because that does not please the Lord. And you know what? Like in that storm that it got really dark and really hard. And I'll tell you, by the time we got to my friend's house, I couldn't feel the tips of my fingers. I mean, I was literally locked on that steering wheel. Nobody was going to take me off that steering wheel. I wouldn't have been so careful if it would have just been me. But there was two other lives I was responsible for. And that's a cost of leadership. As a leader, a person being in leadership, you have to remember when you stumble, there's people you take with you. We can't afford to stumble. Mm. We have to think of the ones that are in the car with us, okay? Okay, so beginning in 57, the word of the Lord says, And now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Come on. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So as bad as the storm got that night, turning back was no option for me. It was no option. We had to keep going. We had to keep, keep our eyes on the destination. I'm going to read out of Psalms 57. And I only have a few scriptures, you guys, but, but the Lord really put this in my heart to kind of talk with you guys about what we learned this past weekend. We were actually gone for five days, and it, it was so nice. 57 what? Psalms 57, verses 1 through 3. And the word of the Lord says, Be merciful to me, O God, and be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until the calamities have passed by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up, Salah. And God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. That's kind of like the prayer I was praying that night on that steering wheel was like, oh God, please, I mean, just show up. I will hold on to a steering wheel, but you're going to have to drive, Lord. I'm asking the angels to guard my, my tires of the car. Don't let me slip or slide. Just, just, just help me to get through this storm. And, and when it's hard to believe when you get back to New Mexico, you know what my mother, my mother-in-law, I, we saw the sign that said, welcome to Mexico. I wanted to pull over and kiss the dirt. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you for the dry dirt. You know, it was just, it was awesome. But, you know, at that moment, as I was crying out to the Lord in that car, I felt that the Holy Spirit really brought me peace. He just really brought me a peace and said, you know what, just keep, just keep going forward. Just keep your eyes on the road. Don't look at the semi trucks. Don't look at everything that's going on. Just keep going forward. And by this time, they had just taken out the snow plows, but they were behind me, so that didn't do me any good. But yeah, but but it was. It kind of felt like, like that storm was never going to end. Mm -hmm. It really felt like that when you're in it. And you're surrounded by these high mountains, which could represent the enemies in your life or the giants in your life. Because, I mean, 
these mountains are massive. And, and then the clouds were so dark and it was snowing so hard. And at that moment, I really felt like this storm's gonna go on forever. And I know that at times in our lives, we go through storms in our lives, whatever it might be, you know, divorce, losing your job, losing a child, and it seems like that storm's gonna go on forever. Like that storm is never gonna end. That hurt is never gonna end. You almost have things coming at you at such a fast pace that you can't see your way, you know, and even your spiritual windshield wipers are not enough to wipe away the tears that you cry when you go through storms like that. But we have to trust that, that God is leading us and guiding us on the road that we're supposed to be on because honestly, I'll tell you, it got to a point to where, I mean, I, I could see like a little bit of my hood. And I really had to trust in God that night that he was going to get all of us there to safety. You know, but it's a beautiful thing when you're in the midst of that and, and you feel peace. You feel peace, you know. And then I think, you know, my mother-in-law and our friend Sylvia felt the peace too because, you know, it kind of just seems like everything just quieted down. And, and you know, and, and it was it was nice. To have two people with me to share that storm with me. Mm. Even though I knew I was driving and I was responsible for their lives, if I took my eyes off of the road, I would not only probably kill myself, but get them killed. So I really had to just stay focused, hold on to that steering wheel, and pray. Mm. And so many times we're going through storms of life, we have to hold on to God. We have to hold on to God and we have to pray and we have to believe like every time before God is going to show up. Mm -hmm. He's going to show up no matter how bad the storm gets and storms get bad. But but we we got to where the big like pancake size snowballs started turning into little snowflakes and then it turned into slush and then it turned into rain and then it stopped. And And so when we got to our friend's house, I mean, it, it was raining and it rained all night, but, but you know what, we, we were out of danger. We, we got home, we were in a warm bed, and it, even if we can hear the thunder and the lightning and the rain and the winds and everything outside, we, we were under the safety of the roof, you know, and, and it was good to be home in a safe place. And, and what the, the scripture that the Lord gave me to explain that feeling that night as I was laying in bed and just thanking God that we weren't laying in a hospital room somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, is Psalms 91. So if you want to go to Psalms 91 verses 1 through 2. Salmos 91. Versículo 1 y 2. And this scripture is named safety and abiding in the presence of God. And it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Mm -hmm. See, I wasn't trusting in my car. I wasn't trusting in the tires. I wasn't trusting in, in anything else. I was trusting that God was leading us where we had to go. And, and that night, you know, as I was laying in bed, this scripture came to mind and I said, thank you, God. Because just like now we're in, and we're in home and we're in a warm bed and, and, you know, there's a roof over our head. That's kind of like the safety that I felt in that car. I kind of felt like the Holy Spirit just embraced me. And, and it was so beautiful. And before I, I forget, I want to go back a little bit to the conference. You know, it was, it, was, it was so awesome for me to see in those three days how much my mother and I took in and how much she grew and, and how beautiful the spirit of discernment is growing in her because she knew what to take and what to leave. Mm. You know, because it doesn't matter what conference you go to, what, I mean, big things like this. There'll always be something you don't agree with, maybe something that's not biblical. But I didn't say anything. I wanted her to just take 
what she needed and leave what she didn't. And as we went back to her room and we talked and she, you know, told me about certain things and this is what I saw and this is what, and, and I was so proud and I said, that's the spirit of discernment that the Holy Spirit is growing in you and she's learning to discern the things and she's learning the word of God. And, and she's not now just being spoon-fed anything. She's saying, hey, that sounded kind of good, but it wasn't exactly right. You know what I mean? And, and that's a beautiful thing to see somebody grow like that. But, I mean, I had the honor and privilege of praying with a young lady and just holding her. I mean, she was going through a storm. She was going through a storm. She went to the altar and she fell on her knees and... A matter of seconds, she was on her face and she was weeping. I mean, one of those weeps that comes when a mother has just lost a child from the depths of her soul. She was just crying. And, and I was kneeling next to her praying and the Holy Spirit told me she could really use a friend right now. And I turned around and, and I anointed my hands and I anointed her head and I just, I just prayed over her. I laid hands and I prayed over her. And then, and after probably, probably a good half hour of just praying over her, she lifted her head and I, I embraced her and she hugged me so tight. I mean, I don't know how long, half an hour, 45 minutes, she just, and I could just feel that my heart was beginning to beat in tune with her heart. We were two women who our spirits understood each other had been through similar things, have made similar mistakes, but she was repenting with all of her heart like I Amen. once did. And, and, and we just became spiritual sisters, spiritual friends, if you will, and I held her and we cried. And, and then I took her up to the altar for prayer and I left her there and I never even asked her what her worry was because that's a very private thing between her and God, but I just let her know there's somebody here who understands you, somebody here who loves you, somebody cares that you're hurting. And I remember as I was leaving the altar, <clears throat> and sometimes like we do, we can get that selfish mentality that we go to these things because I need to be fed, I need to receive, I need, I need, and I did need refreshment. But as I was walking down and I went back to my seat, I knelt on the floor and prayed and I said, dear God, I said, I love to give. I love to give God and you know my heart, but don't take me wrong, Lord, but I came here to receive because I felt like I didn't have anything else to give. I felt tired. And the Lord told me my living water flows and it never ends. Mm -hmm. It never ends and it was never intended for you to take that living water and hold it inside of you. That living water was meant for it to flow through you. I give it to you, receive it, and you give it. And I give it to you, and you receive it, and you give it. And the more you give, the more I give to you. And Hallelujah. I will always refresh you. Amen. And there was, good word. there was one girl that needed to know that it was not just about me, but that I cared about her. And the blessing was double to me. Because I was able to just let her know, if nobody else is noticing you, God is noticing you. And it was beautiful, you know. And then, in that, that evening service, we were worshiping. And I, I was worshiping with my eyes closed. And I was just loving on the Lord. And I was just taking everything that the Lord was giving me and receiving it. And then the Lord told me, my daughter, open your eyes. Open your eyes and look at the women. And as I opened my eyes, I was almost taken back because I saw the women with what seemed to be backpacks on their backs. And some of them were small and some of them were large and some of them were even bigger than the person themselves. And as I looked like that, everybody was just worshiping God and nobody noticed that anybody else had that burden on their back. And, and if you've ever seen Pilgrim's Progress, I understood what those were. 
And I said, dear God, I said, look at the burdens. There was one elderly lady that she had one all the way from the top of her head, all the way past her feet. And the Lord said, look at the burdens of my daughters. Look at the burdens. And as I looked at that mama, my heart broke and I began to cry. And the Lord said, that is the burden for her children. She has children who, has reje who have rejected her. She has children who have left the, her home and she doesn't know where they are. Look at that woman over there. Her husband beat her right before the conference. He didn't want her to come and she came anyway because she's looking for me. You see that woman over there? She's a single mom. When she goes back, she won't have enough for the rent because she chose to spend that money to come here and seek me so I will provide for her rent. You see that other woman over there? She lost a child. And, and the Lord just kept pointing out the burdens of these women to me. And as he kept doing this, I felt like somebody had dropped 10,000 pounds on my back and I fell to my knees and I just cried and I prayed for these women and I said, God, please, please give these women the peace and the comfort that they need to deal with the burdens that they brought here today and all of a sudden it wasn't about I need to get refreshed it was dear God there's a lot of work to do there is a lot of work to do there's a lot of people to reach there's a lot of people to love on and I just I fell to my knees I don't know how long I was there I just fell to my knees and I found myself praying for each and every one of these women because as the Lord showed me what their burdens were, I felt like my heart was going to explode from love and concern and sympathy. I wanted to go and hug each and every woman there and, and I just broke down and cried. And, but you know that night I, I slept like a baby. I just slept because I just prayed peace over them. And as I prayed peace over them, peace came over me. And it's a beautiful thing how God, how when, you, when you're not selfish in what you want and, and you're praying for somebody else, what you need, the Lord brings it anyway. And it was such a beautiful experience. Oh my goodness. And, and I just, oh my gosh. One of the guest speakers that was there has just recently lost her husband. She called, she said she lost her honey. I guess that was her name for him and she had recently lost her honey. But she was still there doing the work of the Lord. And, and she had chose not to continue pastoring the church that they had pastored together for 34 years. The Lord told her, I want you to go under the leadership of your son who is a pastor. So she went to his church and she's under his leadership and stuff, but and she had spoken that day and then the next morning when I woke up, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, can you go and buy her flowers and tell her that I love her? So I told my mother, I need to go get flowers. So I'm asking the front desk, where's an Albertsons? Where's something where I can buy flowers? I don't know my way where I call her. Thank God for GPS, okay? Oh my gosh, I'm like, okay. So I found a store that sold flowers. I ran in for flowers, ran out, got back to the conference just with 20 minutes of time. And I went up to the front and I handed her the flowers and I told her, these are from Jesus. And, and he told me to tell you that he loves you and he's enough. And, and, and tears just flowed like water and we cried and it was just a beautiful, beautiful time. If you've never been to a woman's conference, I recommend that you really go. But that you go with an open heart and let the Lord lead you and guide you. Don't don't go like sometimes we go to a buffet like Pac-Man's. You know, what can I eat? You know, we just look like Pac-Man's. It's like, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, 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 me. Look around. Take time to look around and see who's hurting. See who needs prayer. Because you know what? With whatever I took there. By giving to somebody else, the Lord not only refreshed me and took what I had to leave there, but he gave me more than enough. And when we're going through that storm in the mountain, that more than enough came in handy, let me tell you. It really did. So by giving, we receive. That is so true that by giving, we receive. And it was such a beautiful time.
I want to say, take a minute to say thank you to my friend Silvia. That she just welcomed us in our home and she's just such a beautiful person and I love her. And we only got to spend a little bit of time with her because I had stuff I need to come. We have responsibilities here at the church, you know, but but one of these days we're going to go and we're going to spend a couple of weeks over there and you're going to throw us out of your house finally. Cause, but I love you, Sylvia. Thank you. <laughs> So the next scripture I'm going to take you to is Nahum. Nahum, I guess. Nahum. Uh, or Nahum. Nahum. And it's verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. And it's a short one. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. It's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Luis, didn't you learn anything while I was gone? Okay, so the word of the Lord says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Amen. You know, it's a beautiful thing. That when you can see these mountains that are so huge and, and you can see these rivers that are so wide and just, I mean, they're just like vicious. The waves are going and, and you just think in the presence of God, they're, they're nothing. It's nothing. Those, those mountains can represent worries in our lives, bills, whatever it might be. And, and, you know, I could feel a lot of those women there because I was a single mom and I raised two boys, but I didn't raise them by myself. Jesus Christ walked with me every step of the way. And I didn't realize that, you know, until, until I let go of my pride and, and stop saying, well, look what I did. I raised my kids. Nobody helped me. It, it, he did. It was Jesus all the way. Because when there was times that I had to choose between groceries or paying the rent, the pastor and his wife would come and knock on the door and bring me a box of food from the pantry without even knowing that I was lacking. And, and you know, the Lord took care of me through those times. Even though I was working two jobs to support my kids, there was still, there was, time, there was times of needs and the Lord always came through for me. Always. So well, as we're going through the mountains, um, we went to the mountains in Aspen. Our friend Sylvia took us to Aspen. Oh, oh my gosh. I looked at that mountain and you can't even see all the way to the top because the clouds, I mean the mountains touching the clouds. And, and I stood there at the foot of the mountain and I was thinking, what, what, what was going through the mind of Moses when the Lord was calling him off the mountain. Mm. You know, there wasn't those little ski lifts, and, you know, I can imagine. No, Moses had to walk up that mountain. But I can imagine that he was walking up that mountain with fear and trembling because he knew yeah. that he had a meeting with the Lord. Amen. And I'm looking up at that mountain and I'm like, oh my gosh, I would never be able to climb up there. You know, it's just so tall, so big, so beautiful. <laughs> but at the same time, intimidating. Mm. And there's a sign in Aspen that they put at the foot of the ski area because the ski area is closed right now. And, and that sign says, this is your decision time. And it says, warning, if you choose to go past this sidewalk, you're in danger of an avalanche. You're, and it names all these things. And, and because they put that sign there because the snow is beginning to melt. There's no more skiers. It's closed and stuff. But it's like this is your decision time. And this is kind of what the Lord tells us in our lives sometimes. Mm. When we're deciding, you know, are we going to click? Are we going to click on that pop-up in the computer? Mm. Come on. Hmm. Are we going to cheat on our taxes? Preach it. You know, and then the Holy Spirit comes and says, you know what, this is decision time. You can cross this line that the Lord has put for you. 
But if there's an avalanche of consequences that comes into your life, don't blame God. Come on. Don't blame God. Come on. And and so as I was looking at that warning, I was like, whoa! I even took a picture of the sign because it just so impacted me so much, you know. And and as I'm there, you know, and I'm just like really thinking of scripture and 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 how that sign could be used for a message you know my mother-in-law's come here Michal, let's do a selfie 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 she's learning how to do selfies so we did selfies all day you know sometimes we only got one eyeball or whatever because we couldn't focus the camera but man we had a good time but as we're standing there at the base of this mountain if you guys have never been to Aspen, at least get online and see pictures. It won't do it justice. When you're there... I and think Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dumb and Dumber does <laughs> No, me and your mommy weren't on a scooter, okay? <laughs> I didn't like feel warm all of a sudden. Read between the lines, okay? <laughs> Wow, but you know what? But she said, you know what? Okay, please calm down. As we were there at the ski area and stuff, and then it got kind of cold, so she goes, you know what? Google the Starbucks, see if there's a Starbucks we can get a coffee. And there wasn't a Starbucks, but we went and got a hot chocolate, and then she took us to the other side of the mountain, because there's the, there's the mountain of Aspen here, and then there's another mountain. And, and she drove up there, and... Um, so we were up high and we could see everything. We could see all of Aspen, we could see the mountain, we could see the ski area, we could see everything. And it's awesome that when you're up high, you can see everything that's down below. So down be when you're up there, you can say, okay, well, there's the McDonald's, there's, a, there's everything, you know, you see everything. And that's kind of how the eyes of the Lord on, are on us all the time. You know, we might think, you know what, we're home alone, our wife isn't home, our husband isn't home, my boss isn't watching, I can take an extra five minutes, I'll go clock in and then take an extra five minutes for my lunch, but we have to remember that God's on high and his thoughts are higher than ours and his ways are higher than ours and the Bible says that his eyes are never never off of his children. So whatever you're clicking on, whatever you're doing, you have to remember that the Lord has an eye on you. Even if nobody else is watching you, God sees what we do all the time. Yes. You know, so we, we have to really be careful not to disrespect the Lord with our actions. But Aspen is gorgeous, just beautiful. I'm gonna take you to a Psalm, Psalms 97. Psalms 97 verses one through five. Ninety-seven, and then verses one through five. And this scripture is called the song of praise to the sovereign Lord. And the word of the Lord says, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him and righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His lightning, his lightnings light the world, and the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord, the whole earth. When I called my husband and he told me, man, I've always wanted to go to Aspen, and I was telling him about the mountains. And I said, isn't it amazing? And I said, as big as these mountains are and as fierce as they look, I would want to get lost up there. I mean, the, you can see the pine trees are frozen white from the snow. Everything just looks so frozen. And I said, I would not want to be lost up there for one or two hours. But as fierce as that mountain look, the word of the Lord says that the mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. So no matter how many mountains we're struggling with in our lives, we have to understand that no matter how high the mountain, how dark the storm, how scary the road, our God is bigger. 
Because the Bible says that God holds the universe in the span of his hand. Not the world. The universe in the span of his hand. And the word of the Lord says that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Wow. He's walking amongst us. He's walking amongst us and he might even be next to you. And you don't even know. There's a quote from Thomas Adams that I want to share with you. Thomas Adams has a lot of beautiful quotes. There's one that says that, let me see if I can remember how it goes. God took woman from man, but then man comes from woman. What was one became two, but then in marriage, what was two has become one. Mm. Isn't that so beautiful? But there's another quote that he has, and it says, he who sends the storm is the one who steers the vessel. You know, if you go to the book of Genesis, when the Lord was giving Noah instructions on making the ark, the Lord gave Noah a blueprint he told him, use gopher wood. Why gopher wood? Because gopher wood withstands the moisture and it doesn't rot. Because mm -hmm. the last thing you want is to have a ship full of animals and the wood starts rotting. And it just, you know, once it just going to start dropping one by one. So the Lord gave him instructions. Make an ark of gopher wood. And you're going to make it three stories. And you're going to make kennels in there for all the animals. And you're going to put one window up on top. And there's only going to be one door but if you study that scripture, that window was way up on top because God knew that come the time he was going to have Noah send a dove out through that window to see if the water had receded. And if you also read the instructions that God gave Noah, there wasn't a handle outside of that door because once God shut the door, that door was shut and no man could open it. Mm -hmm. Not even Noah himself. Because Noah being a righteous man, when it began to rain and he could hear the screams of the women and children and the men saying, Noah, please open the door. We were your neighbors. Noah, please. Noah, God knew that Noah being a righteous man was going to want to open that door. So God shut that door. But if you also notice in the instructions that the Lord gave Noah on that big ship, there was no sail and there was no rudder. Noah had no control of where that ship was going to go. God was driving that ship. Mm. God had total control of where Noah was going to go. And he shut the door. And I'm going to tell you something that the Bible says that right before the coming of the Lord. And if you go and read what God told Noah, and he said, Noah, I want you to build an ark because I'm going to destroy the earth. Because there's only evil in it. Everything is evil. And I repent that I have even made it. You can feel God's heart. And so Noah built the ark, but the Lord is sovereign. See, the Lord provided everything that Noah needed. The gopher wood trees. The Lord called the animals to come two by two. Noah didn't have to go through all the whole world. Can you imagine Noah trying to steer an elephant to, and a tiger and a lion and a bear and a... I mean, can you imagine? So the Lord called the animals to come to Noah and Noah's putting him on the ship. Noah had no control over a lot of things. But the Lord is sovereign and he gave Noah 120 years time. It took Noah 120 years to build the ark. And I go back and I think why did Noah take so long? Because Noah, being a righteous man, 
I'm sure he thought, okay, you know what, we'll put one board today, we'll put two boards tomorrow, you know. And the Lord's watching Noah and saying, that's okay, I'm long-suffering, I can wait. And Noah's praying, maybe some of my neighbors will repent. Mm. Maybe some of my friends will repent. Maybe this nation will seek God and God will change his mind. And after he built the ark, 120, can you imagine? 120 years, Noah was already, what, 900 when the Lord called him to build the ark? 900? Wow! And they're by hand, they're hauling these logs of gopher wood. They're, they're stirring these animals into the, they're closing them, they're feeding them. Can you imagine what it smelled in there? Everything. But 120 years, the Lord allowed Noah to take to build the ark because he saw Noah's heart. Noah was righteous. He was hurting. He knew what was going to happen. He was warning people. And people come and say, why are you building that? People go, what are you doing? Are you going crazy? No, God's going to bring rain upon the earth and he's going to flood the earth because you're evil. You don't want to change from your ways. You don't want to repent. You don't want to stop clicking on that button. You don't want to put the iPhone down to pick up the Bible. And God saw that Noah was going to hurt. So he allowed him to take his time. And Noah was thinking, as I, as I tell them what God's going to do, maybe then they'll repent. I can get some laborers over here on this boat. But they laughed at him. They scoffed at him. Rain. There's never been rain on the earth before. What are you talking about? Cocoa puffs. You know, you ain't too many cocoa puffs. And they're laughing at him. They're scoffers. But then you go to these end times. And the Bible says that these end times are going to be as in the days of Noah. That people be marrying and giving in marriage and having parties and watching Super Bowl and clicking on the buttons and having affairs and cheating on their taxes and cheating at work and doing all this. And then all of a sudden, God's going to shut that door. That trumpet's going to blow. And the ones who stay behind, it's not going to be pretty. And the warning signs are there, but the Bible also says in the last days it's going to be scoffers that are going to laugh at us Christians and say, really? Jesus is coming back? They've been saying Jesus is coming back for 2,000 years. Good. We're 2,000 years closer than when they started saying that Jesus was coming back. But start studying the scriptures. Start reading the prophecies. Start putting the prophecies of the Old Testament in alignment with what Jesus has said. Jesus is coming really soon. And you can sit there and you can laugh at us and you can scoff <clears throat> and you can say that we're crazy. Mm -mm. But the day is going to come when the Lord is going to close that door. Mm -hmm. You're going to wake up someday and you're going to find millions of people are missing from the earth. And it's not the aliens from Roswell that came for the people. It's Jesus Christ. He's going to come for the people. We're going to be raptured up. We're going to meet the Lord in the clouds. And the ones who stay here to suffer through tribulation. Read what the word says about that. It's going to be hard. So we're standing here as Noah did in those days. And we're saying, please repent. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you think, you know what, I don't have to go to church to pray. No, you don't have to go to church to pray. But we know what, when the wolves come and circle you, it's better to be amongst people who care about you, who can fight with you, and who can fight for you, and Amen. who can embrace you, and hold you, pick you up from the floor Amen. like I did that young lady, and take you to the altar of the Lord and say, this is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way. I don't care what Oprah says, I don't care what anybody says. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way. And that date's going to come when that door's going to shut. Because as of in the days of Noah, we're living them. We're living them. It's now. It's now. 
So we really have to think about the road that we're taking. Look around you. Sometimes the grass looks greener on the other side, but it's just <laughs> something that Satan paints that I don't even want to use the word. But you get the picture. <clears throat> you know, as the day draws closer for the Lord to come, even the secular world, even the atheists, even the people who don't believe in God are saying, hey, something's going on. <clears throat> Something's going on because we've gone from bad times to evil times. Take time one of these days. If you're in a store or you're in a restaurant, you run into a paramedic or a police. And ask them if they don't think evil exists. When they go and they pick up children who have been beat to death by one of their parents with a shoe. Mm -hmm. Or drowned in a bathtub. Or when they go pick up a mom and dad who have been shot in the head by one of their children, tell me if evil doesn't exist. Ask them. They probably have nightmares. They probably can't sleep from the things that they see. This is why every time I'm driving somewhere and an ambulance passes by me or police officers pass by me with sirens, I just take a moment and I pray for them and I say, God, protect their minds and their eyes, their hearts and their soul, whatever they're going to, whatever they're going to see. Whatever they're going to witness, protect them. Put a supernatural shield around their mind, their heart. Protect them. Because the evil is real. And if you think what we read in the newspaper or what we hear in the news is bad, can you imagine having to go and pick up these children? Mm. Can you imagine having to go pick up a 20-year-old girl who her husband thought it was okay to beat her to death? I mean, come on. Let's put down our phones and let's start picking up our Bibles. Let's start strengthening ourselves in the Word so that we can go out there and we can help these people. We need to do it. Pastor is going to begin a um, discipleship program, the SWAP. And, evangelizing. And evangelizing and, and he's, we'll be announcing it. We'll announce it. But he's going to start this ministry on how to go out into the street and reach people because we need to Not we need to, to be able street, but to their workplace their and workplace home our families birthday parties graduations you know what's really sad to me come graduation time and it will be here in a few weeks i think this i got my favorite there's the other one use the other one it'll be here in a few weeks graduation as you have all these kids and they've graduated high school and they're just ready to begin life and they're excited and they rent a limo and a tux and a beautiful dress and all this and then they go somewhere where they're offered liquor and sometimes they drink a little too much there's accidents there's alcohol poisoning there's drug overdoses and these these kids have just started their life and the enemy snatches it away from them. You know, if, if, if you're watching my Facebook and you're just getting ready to graduate high school, think about what you're going to do on that day. Think about it. Because if you're out celebrating, and you're not celebrating in a way that's honoring God, it's good to go celebrate. That's a big accomplishment. But you want to be careful in the choice you make because the consequences can follow you the rest of your life. Mm. You get these young ladies that get pregnant and they either have an abortion or every, every dream that they had in their life has to stop for a moment so they can raise a child. So there are consequences to your actions. So think about what you're going to do on that night. But as I began to close... As I begin to close now, I just, I want to say goodbye to you on Facebook first before we close off. And I just want to say God bless you. And I, I really want to let you know that if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, find a Bible-believing church. And if you don't have a church, you're welcome to come here. 
The name of the church is Majesty Worship Center. We're at 3250 Coors Boulevard, Northwest, Suite B. Our services are on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and on Wednesday at 6.30. And you can check on Facebook and, and see other events that we'll have be coming up. There's a men's conference going to be coming up in September. But if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, seek a church. Pick up a Bible. Find a Christian friend. Unstop your ears and listen to the word of God. Bend a knee and give your life to Jesus. And I promise you, it's going to be not the easiest, but the best decision you will ever make. So God bless you and we'll see you on Sunday.